All right, TJ Martino podcast, and we have an awesome, awesome episode today. Uh, very, very different, but also something I want to explore more is, you know, history, mythology, uh, geology, all of these different subjects uh, we're going to cover today. And today I had to bring in two people who know a lot about subject that I'm very fascinated in, but don't know a whole lot about, and that is the continent of Antarctica and the history, the mysteries, and the geology of the continent that is mainly uninhabited. So today, to help me, uh, I have Laura Kissel, the polar coordinator, or I'm sorry, the polar curator of the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center here in Columbus, Ohio, at the Ohio State University. I want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> but then I also have Jason Servanek here, who is the director of Student outreach, right? Am I correct there? Uh, director of education and outreach. Education and outreach. I'm yep. sorry, got to do better. But uh, more, yeah. more than just students. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So education and outreach. So, uh, kind of going to both you guys. Just going to what? What got you into Antarctica? What got you into, you know, studying this continent and studying the history and obviously the uh, the natural uh, climate and geology of the area. So, um, uh, Laura, could you move your microphone oh, a little yeah. bit closer? Yeah, sure. sorry. Is this better? Uh, you can move a little bit closer, even. Okay. That's good. Good. Uh, so, uh, I fell into this job, not going to lie. Uh, I have a master's in library and information science, um, and I had worked in the university libraries as a student. So, um, then I got a staff job when I graduated. Anyway, uh, when I got my master's of library and information science, I started applying for any possible job at Ohio State because I wanted to come back here. And I landed here on a contract job processing a polar collection right out of library school. So that was just my good luck. Um, and from there, uh, my contract job turned into a permanent position and evolved into the polar curator job. So just lucky. That's how I landed here. Yeah, uh, the Bird Center's was 60 years old last year, and so it's a very well established. It's the oldest interdisciplinary center at Ohio State, and my predecessor, Carol Landis, started the outreach program and started that part-time after she retired as a teacher and, and was a colleague of mine. And so uh, about nine years ago, I applied to, to fill the position when she retired. Ironically, um, I was really interested in the subject, but I had done work at archives and on different projects as a student at Ohio State. So I remember, remember Laura in the interview, it was a big interview with about 15 people there, and her, she perked right up and said, oh, you've done work with archives, have you? <laughs> um, and we, I'd done the University Museum project, so I was pretty well versed in how this facility operated before I even started. Wow, and so when, when did you guys both like officially get started at OSU? Like, what year? I started, I mean, as a student, I came here in right. 1996. So I, oh, mm. <laughs> I graduated from here with a bachelor's degree in 1983. Okay. Awesome. And then I, I worked in the libraries until 1990. Then I left for seven years and then I came back. Um, and that's when I started in this position. Yeah. So before we get into actual, like the actual continent of Antarctica, uh, I kind of wanted to ask like what kind of work you guys do uh, on behalf of like the research for the, the Bird Center. Right, so my job in particular has to do uh, actually more with people who don't work at The Ohio State University and more with people all over the world. So anybody who has a interest in the history of polar exploration and the collections that we hold here, so it's my job to help them do that kind of research. Um, we do. That's not to say that Ohio State people don't use the polar collections, but the mo but the majority of users of polar historical collections are not Ohio State University people. Yeah. So you deal with a lot of people from all over the world. All over right? the world. Yep. Yep. And uh, so, like, what 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 goes into actually? Like, let's just say I want to do a research project on Antarctica. Like, mm. what what is the process? I guess to like get access to the archives and to the to the artifacts and information. Oh, wow. Okay, so first of all, my first comment would be, Antarctica is very broad, so let's right. try to narrow that down. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yep. First, we try to get you focused. Um, but really, after that, we put our, our finding aids, which is basically an inventory list of what is in our collections online. And so it is my job to help you navigate that. It can be a little bit overwhelming. If you've never done research in an archives before, it, it feels right. hard. It feels heavy and it's hard. But it's really 
we can really walk you through that. So once I figure out exactly what it is you're trying to do, then I can point you in the direction of what collections will inform your research. So then you make an appointment. I showed you the book stacks right. when yeah, you came in. Right, they're massive. Yeah, they're massive. So 30 feet high, we access everything by a forklift. You can't just brow- walk in and hope to browse here. So we um, make an appointment, you come in, we pull the material that we think will be of your interest, and then you can get busy. You you read it. We we used to do a lot of photocopying, but now we just let people take pictures of documents with their cell phones, and right. people love that. So that's kind of how it works. In in short. And like so, what are like the what are the most researched like mm-hmm. topics? I guess you would say since you said that Antarctica, like you said, it's very broad. There's a lot of different research because it's such a large continent, and it's mm-hmm. a lot of it's undiscovered. Like. So with that, like, what, what is like the most researched so, topics? So, yeah, so there is a broad range of topics, but I can tell you that the collections that are most used here, the top three are probably the bird papers. Right. We're named for bird. This year, the Wilkins collection is hot. There, Wilkins is seeing, Wilkins is an Australian. Mm-hmm. Um, individual and in Australia he's becoming more well known and there are a lot of anniversaries related to Wilkins and his work um, in in Antarctica so this year I'm getting a lot of requests having to do with Wilkins and the Wilkins collection Um, and then the third one and that one varies over time so sometimes it's the American Polar Society sometimes it's the papers of Frederick Cook just depends on what's going on in the yeah. world um more things relate to antarctica than people realize oh yeah <laughs> i agree and so yeah jason what, what kind of research is it that uh you do yeah so, so when i was first hired the the majority of the work was what's called the broader impacts for all our federal grants so there's a requirement on national science foundation grants you communicate the science to the public and right. that can be through science centers zoo programs schools but you have to have that as an integral part of your project so we started out there. We've always had a, a pretty large demand for bird tours of the center. Yeah. We run about probably ten or 12,000 people through those programs. But then it expanded into research projects, educating the public about geosciences, about polar regions. So we have some online tools, Fluid Earth Viewer, which is a globe you can interact with the atmosphere. Yes. A similar one, which is a VR product. You can actually go to some of these remote parts of the world and explore them in VR or on your computer and tablet. And then a growing amount of work that's both research, but then applied projects with what's climate is called climate resilience. So helping people in the Midwest make their communities more resilient to climate change. Okay. And um, what do you think it is like uh, going back to to Bird and Wilkins? Like, what do you think it is about? I mean, their their research was done 100 years ago, now 80 years ago. Like, what is it about that? research that gets people interested do you think and this i guess is a question for both of you but Mm. like what is it about those two individuals and their research that is drawing people to that information well i would say that well well i think we know what the drive is in terms of wilkins right because wilkins was relatively unknown in australia becoming more well known he was on an expedition with Ernest Shackleton and people who don't know anything about polar have heard of Ernest Shackleton yes. right it's an, so it's an almost unbelievable story right so he um, is connected to a bunch of different expeditions over time so I think that people are fascinated by that period of time they're per- they're fascinated by what people of that time period had to go through in order to to conduct their research, but also from a more scientific, I guess, level, climate change is a thing. And so people can go back and look at the documentation that was kept by these guys. It's very different than the documentation we keep today. They can look at the photography, they can look at the written records. Mm And compare that to what we're seeing now. And I think that climate change continues to drive, even if people don't really realize that's why they're interested, I think that that is a huge driver towards these historical collections. Yeah, so you think it's people just trying to get to the root of, you know, climate change? It's that. I also think the other thing, which might be more um, less scientific, but people's family history is all tied up in this. Yeah. So a lot of people went on these expeditions, right. and a lot of people's 
people's grandparents and whatnot, they remember that. So people are really fascinated by their own history. So yeah. I think that plays into it, I never it thought about it like that. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I can imagine, like, do you see so you get a lot of people that just go and they're just like, I just want to see, you know, my, grand, my grandpa was in this research. I want to just see what exactly they were researching. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, that's interesting. And, mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, you can get tied up in these kind of topics just off of family, like, you know, with anything, you know, if your family served in the war, that may incentivize you to want to go research that specific war, you know, just to know, get into their headspace almost. And mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a, we get a lot of that. Sure. When uh, you also get contributions that come, you have yes. people that come to presentations and talks or hear Laura discussing something and then you get people that will contribute stuff to the collection that their family had. Right. That happens a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's actually, I was going to ask, like, so yeah, what, what, with that, like, what is one example, if, if you have one, of like really like crazy artifact that somebody just gave you that mm. was like, oh yeah, this is my grandfather's, or this is my dad's, or whatever. So the best story there, the best story, I did not pull this item because it's big, but yeah. um, Admiral Byrd's granddaughter gave us his fur coat. Whoa. So his parka that he wore, we have pictures of him wearing the parka. Yeah. So that's probably the best coolest thing that we've been given but we've been given almost everything that we get for the collection is donated to us we do occasionally purchase items for the collection but most of the time materials are donated to us so uh, there's a amazing flag that hangs over at the bird center that was donated to us and it was the flag that flew at little america base camp in antarctica so it's awesome was it an american flag no, it is a bird uh, Antarctic expedition flag. Okay. So, so oh, made so particularly. Mm-hmm. So that item was given to us. Um, and that person found it in a closet. Like he was <laughs> renting a property or something. It was super weird. Um, so, But most things are donated to us. We have a collection from an individual who was a uh, dog driver. We have collections from the man who kept the cows on the expedition and all those Wait, things. they brought cows? They did. Were they trying to, like, raise livestock down there and see if it worked, or were they just they, doing that for food? Well, they were do, they were doing it for publicity, but they said they were doing it for milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story, and it it, if you think about agriculture, right. we've had a lot of people really interested in this story just because of the agricultural connection. Yeah. Right, right. And, Lots of people studied the cows. Yeah, and I was going to ask, like... Uh, well, I guess I'll just ask this question first, but like how much of Antarctica in 2021 is explored? Like what mm. like, what ballpark percentage would you say? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to you know, yeah. what you define as explored. Somebody's actually like, set foot there or seen it via plane or seen it via satellite. Seen it via plane even. Yeah, um, not satellite cuz like yeah. That it, it's it's hard to say yeah, because I guess. how close I mean, it's even funny to think about up until a few years ago we had better maps of Mars than we did Antarctica. Yeah. And so one of our projects at the Bird Center, our director, Ian Howard, and a number of other universities are doing a lot of work to create really good maps of, of Antarctica. Right. But most governments don't, and most satellite platforms aren't designed to look at that part of the world. Mm-hmm. So we really didn't know in detail what a lot of it looked like. And yeah. even if a plane had flown over it, did they have photographs? There's a lot of places that were unexplored. And it's funny to think about we knew knowing more about another planet than we knew about a, what is critical right. part of our own planet. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Like, is it just because it's so hostile climate or is it just because, you know, they, they don't want to research it? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's well a few things. So it's a hostile climate. Part of the year, it's dark. A lot of our satellites have a hard time with really reflective surfaces yeah. that are white like Antarctica. You think about nobody's collecting taxes down there. It's not <laughs> contested territory. We have yeah. spy satellites. And, and in fact, it wasn't until this project came along that they were able to use data they were collecting for something else and be allowed to use it to map out and to make these models of the continent. And it's opened up a whole new era, you know, Ian Howard, our director, would call it the silicone era of exploration. You had the heroic era and the era of mechanization. Now we're yeah. in this new era where we can use big data and satellites to see stuff in ways we didn't before. Yeah, that, and, um, like, with, uh, with this, I mean, I guess with that too, is it a lot like because of contracts? Because like I, I, Antarctica is a very complicated. And I guess you guys could kind of break this down a little bit. But like I know that Antarctica has a very like rocky history when it comes to like who owns like what sliver of the land and like and isn't it, like seven different countries that signed the Antarctica Treaty or something like that? I don't remember. I think it was a few more than seven. Yeah, you might know yeah, the I don't remember the exact or, number, yeah. but it yeah, I think it's a bigger number than and, that. And, and like why? 
why I guess would they did they like why do you think they came like to that conclusion that this was the best way to do it because like I feel like now with research I can imagine like getting grants and getting like the authorization to go down there has got to be a nightmare because you know there's so many different people running the same place kind of um you know scientific committee for antarctic research is this body that coordinates a lot of this uh we had to go back and look at the history of that treaty coming out of world war ii right. and, and you having contested territory and figuring out a way to mutually govern a continent that really was there for scientific exploration mm -hmm. um, a number of other signatories that came on after the original one signed on but this body coordinating the research that's done and and a lot of the countries cooperate and, and either do shared research or do their research in a certain portion of the continent, largely that s some ways maps with their historical areas work, because that's right. where their bases were set yeah. up. But trying to make sure they overlap and, and figure out strategically what are our areas of research. You also have to realize that so much of the continent's covered by ice that there's only certain places where rock extends above yeah. it, or you have life as we know it that's not microscopic and that dictates where you can work and then can you safely get there and get back yeah that's i guess the biggest question yeah so if you're going to do deep field research you're probably looking at three to four years planning in advance hoping the weather cooperates and then how many people can you have at that remote site and what's going to be the expense and the safety protocols you want to have in place have you either of you guys been there i have not no, no. okay i no. have a lot of a lot of colleagues who have yeah but. and what do they say about it I think outside of that, it's cold. <laughs> I think what was really enjoyable for Laura and I, we had a project a few years ago where Laura got a grant to preserve some historic footage. And we made a Pam Theodotu, who's our media expert, made Bird 1933. Whoa. And it's a movie that parallels the movie that um, Bird would have yeah. shown when he was doing a live talk. But I think what was very moving for us is to watch the number of researchers in our building that unprompted said, watching that video gave me the same feel that it's like the first time as you see the ice when you approach Antarctica by a plane. And they, they said there's just a very emotional response they had. And the way that Pam had set it up, they said, I had that same experience. Yeah. That same excitement was there. Yeah, because it's just like you look over and you just see this giant world of wonder. And it's like, it's amazing because it's it's on our planet. And like you said, like we know more about Mars than we do about Antarctica. And like, you know, they're, they've been making the discoveries like, um, with you know where they're saying that basically there's like an under under ice like uh, river system and there's like lakes and and all that beneath the ice like uh, what kind of research have we gone into with that in the past like 10 years five years because i know that there has been some rumblings about it but yeah so i mean chris gardner who's at the bird center and joel barker who's here he's now at the university of minnesota we're part of a project called salsa Okay. Uh, you have to have a creative name if you're going to do Antarctic <laughs> research. And the project was to drill a, a subglacial lake. And so they drilled through the ice and they ended up puncturing into this lake. And there's a whole ecosystem that's there that was right. was had really not been explored before. And so that whole project is to go ahead and document what was found in that ice, yeah, in that and lake. It, and I've seen like the, the footage from, I think, like an Australian research group that went down there and put like a camera down beneath the like thick ice layer and like you could see like how the vegetation down there just looked completely different and like it just makes you think like how much of like beneath the ice like do we actually like i don't know like i guess like my question is it would it be possible to live in antarctica like i mean like civ, civ like to have like a city almost like a, a civilization like is there is there parts of antarctica that are habitable to people so there's there's nothing that sustains life in Antarctica. Everything has to be brought in. Yeah. Right. So you can't you can't have a dairy farm. Yeah. You can't gray you can't grow a garden, right? So I'm I'm saying no because there's nothing there that is going yeah. to sustain life unless you bring it in. Yeah. That's my vote. I mean, we I do mean, have the city. McMurdo is a city, do. but you know, like, as was mentioned that. Everything comes in on a ship, yeah. and all the waste goes out on a ship. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess your best example, if you want to see a sustained having to support themselves, there is something like the Shackleton expedition, where yeah. by no choice of their own, and you can see how tenuous that was, because you had no way to heat, short of your own body heat, and mm -hmm. you were trying to subsist on the the ocean is the source of the ecosystem mm -hmm. there, right. except for microbes. So they had to eat whatever was available, <laughs> seal yeah. or penguin. Right. So it or would be birds, very maybe? difficult. Yeah. yeah. I just don't. So I vote no only in that there's you can't without outside support. Yeah. You know, so I think McMurdo is staffed year round now. 
Yes. I yeah, mean, yeah. there at some points in time, there are more people there than others, but it's not because they're, you know, out farming the field and yeah. raising the animals and whatever, you know, it's because everything's brought in yeah. and shipped out. So, uh, so is there like, is there any like, uh, like, fr- like, is there any place without snow in Antarctica? Oh, like, yes. is there like, you know, rock quarries or, you know, little lake reserves or anything like that? Or is it just straight ice? Yeah, so I think there's about, I think the percentage is about 2% of the continent is unglaciated. Probably the most famous part is the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Yeah. So we've had a number of research teams that have worked there. This is an area that it's, most of Antarctica is a desert, which mm-hmm. people don't think about because you see these pictures of ice sheets. Yeah. But there's less than 10 inches of wool precip that fall a year. And so what happens is it generally doesn't melt, so it just stacks up. Yeah. But it's considered a cold desert. And in this place, most years, there's no precip. So you have a space devoid of any ice. <laughs> you can see on the mountaintops glaciers that are extending down to the valleys. And maybe for two to three weeks a year, you get water that it gets warm enough the water can melt. So you get mm-hmm. these lakes that emerge. Yeah. And it's considered one of the ecological research sites, a fragile ecosystem that NSF has been studying for more than 25 years because it's so unique. Yeah, because I know in the in the footage uh, from Operation High Jump with Bird that they had found, like, you, there's a video of them running into this, you know, body of water. So, like, yeah, I was... I was wondering, like, if how how common are those? I guess I guess it just was like one that they just happened to stumble upon and happened to be like the time. So it's kind of like you can only see those at certain times of the year, kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, yeah, I was gonna. I guess I'll go into Operation High Jump. Like, you know, it's obviously a huge pot of mythology and you know conspiracy <laughs> and all that. So I mean, I guess I would ask you guys who do this for a living, like. Was it more than just military operations, or was that just simply it? From from all of the information you guys have seen, from Bird's own writings, from all of it, like was it just them preparing for a potential Cold War situation, or were they down there for other sorts of research? Well, so the the first thing to say about that is at when Bird stopped self funding his own expeditions. And they began to be funded by the U.S. military. So that starts in 1939. Yes. That documentation of all of that stuff lives in the U.S. National Archives. So the amount of material that we have in our collection, starting with 1939 and, and to the present, well, you know, to the 80s, yeah. um, for Bird is a lot less. All that said, the Operation High Jump thing and its relation to the, you know, hollow earth and all that yeah. stuff. I get I get questions about that every year. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't had I don't I guess I have had a couple this year. Usually so so what people want to know is where's where's the diary from that cuz yeah. that's supposedly online. Right. I saw it online, it must be true. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have that and in fact we don't have anything in our collection that substantiates any of that. Yeah. So you know, I, based on what little I know, I, I, I've had researchers come here. We pull all of the material. We, you know, it's so you've open. done like deep dives into this into this topic. In no, particular, I haven't actually. Okay. I've let my researchers do okay. the deep dive. So they did. Okay. <laughs> they do the deep dive. And what, not and what me. are they? What have they? They walk away bummed because yeah. they don't <laughs> find this. Yeah, the particular the, the smoking gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one's found that here that I'm aware of. Um, if they found it here, I'm pretty sure we'd know. Yeah. Laura makes an important point, though, on what, how do you arrive at, at fact or right. backing up a claim, which is, and we had a great conversation with a, a question Laura received, I think it was on a Friday after somebody had a bar argument on a Thursday night, yeah. about <laughs> a snack food that, yeah. that was purported to have been brought on a bird expedition. And it was great, you know, the answer you can give is, it wasn't a yes or no answer Laura could give. I think the answer was, we have no evidence in the collection to support that that product right. was ever brought to Antarctica. It wasn't yes, it was, or no, it wasn't. It's There's no evidence yeah, that right. it was. Right. And, and so you that's have to be able to tie it to evidence. That's always my answer. Yeah. When I, if we don't, look, I won't guess and I won't make it up. Right. Because somebody out there knows the truth. And if you do that, you will get you will get caught. So right. that's just not my way. So that is always my answer. It, there's no evidence in the bird collection to support 
the idea that the earth is hollow and that bird knew it. And, yeah. You know, whatever. So that's always that that's absolutely true. It, yeah. Just because I can't find it doesn't mean it's not so. Right. The absence of evidence does not mean evi- evidence of absence. Yeah. But that's right. At the same time, it's like, yeah, the, it's a little bit of a stretch. But at the same time, it kind of like it. And I think that's part of the reason that people, especially in this decade, have become more fascinated with polar yeah. research, because it's just this big white blob on the map and everybody's like there's there's got to be more than ice and penguins down here like you know and that's i guess what stirred the conversation but so long but and i and i know like it's like it's hard because there's just it without like there's so many gaps that need to be filled and like you know it could easily just be explained away as like you know we could find out maybe something comes to the surface and it just ends up being no that wasn't the case it was you know they were just down there for operations but i mean yeah i guess that's I don't know. I've always found it interesting when thinking about Antarctica, and I wanted to ask you guys since you you know you have the collection here, and I think that's it's interesting. Well, we have so many people that have worked down there too. I always tell people you have to trust in the experts that have been there to see it and to help put the puzzle together. And we have we have tens of people in our building that have been down there two, three, four, fifteen, eighteen times. Wow! And so we've had people call with questions, and I said, you know, if you're not willing to trust these multitude of experts been down there, I don't really have a better answer for (laughs) you. Because we they've seen it from so many different disciplines, some of them going back all the way to the '60s. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And the other thing is to remember is that we are not the only polar archives. Right, right. So again, the mention of the National Archives and documentation is held all over the place. Mm-hmm. So when I know of it, then I point. You know, if we don't have it, then I want you to keep going, keep right. looking, keep. Keep researching, and I try to help. And a people. lot of it is with high jump, and I think that's and I think the thing that, that's made people kind of go into it more is the fact that it's so cla- a lot of it is still very classified, and and you know it it just again it, it leads to more questions and more you know and it, it, I guess it, it gets hard because you know. Well, I will tell you that the um, folks who declassify information came here and declassified everything, the bird papers, every single thing. So the material that we do have that relates to that all declassified okay so i don't know for sure that that's actually true i don't know for a fact that that there's still a lot of material classified on that i don't know if that's true okay just because they spent weeks here because we do have some as i mentioned Mm -hmm. um they spent weeks here going through all of it and declassified every document that they laid their hands on and in fact told me that if other material that they had not seen you know, it's a large collection, right. 600 boxes of stuff um, that we could assume anything additional related to that that we would find in our collection would also be declassified. Yeah. And, and so you mentioned that you do have information on mm-hmm. Operation High Jump that is declassified. What, what would you say is like the most interesting thing that you've seen <laughs> from that collection? I mean, I know you haven't gone through all 600 boxes, but I mean, from what you've seen, you know, what was something that was like, oh, that's interesting, you know? No, they, yeah, just a lot of. <laughs> it's just all logistical. Like there isn't anything to me that was all that. Yeah, and I think I like the early. St- I, I love the early stuff. I like Bert's handwriting on things. Mm-hmm. I like the all the lists he made. I like all the logistical. You know, this is all very uh, U.S. military. Here are your orders. Mm-hmm. We're going to do X, Y, Z. It's just you know at this point in time, Bird is really more of a figurehead and less in control. Mm-hmm. So for for me personally, what is there is very much reports and just nothing that really. Yeah, a lot of hearsay. Well, it's just it's just not that I just don't find it to be. There isn't anything there that. Yeah, it's gets just a lot going. of like operations talk. Yeah, like. I mean it's just nothing that really. I, again, have I read every document? I have not. So, yeah, you know, remember, my job is to help you find the documents you want to read. Yeah. And I guess when the U.S. military support comes, things become a lot more standardized. Yes. We could talk about what an expedition looks like today. But when they're on on their own in the 20s and 30s, you are on your own, Mm -hmm. self-supporting. You're arranging everything. And now in the era we're in now, so much of it's been there's a process you follow. You apply for your application. You have to fill it out well in advance. Mm -hmm. There's medical checkup they do dental yeah. checkup depending on where you're going there's there's protocols for how your equipment needs to be handled for personal stuff and lab stuff that's going into the field and all that's done two or three years ahead of time to provide the safety net and logistics do they provide any training for like how to deal with the the cold i guess like is it kind of like do they have like a 
pseudo like space program kind of thing. You know how they like train astronauts how to go to how to go to how to go to the moon and deal with those. Climate? Is there anything like that that they prepare these explorers uh, even in modern day like to kind of you know give them a sense of what it is going to be like when they set foot on the ice? Well, I think there's a few things. One is you know the application process itself, and there's a whole mm -hmm. giant manual to follow right. as you prepare for that. When you get there, there's wraparound services, so you. They have um, contractors that handle all the transportation logistics. There's a lot of field support people that are there to make sure everything gets done safely. There might be a mountaineer assigned to your team to make sure that you know there's certain protocols tra handled if you're in crevasse fields. There is a, a safety school that they make sure you're able to do a survival school and stay out overnight. Depending on how far in you're going, there might be additional training required or additional staff that's with you, medical staff or mountaineers. But that's something that wouldn't have been afforded then. They would have had to do it all on their own versus NSF now has protocols, the National Science Foundation, that you have to follow to make sure that people are safe in the field. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I mean, like how many, you said it takes like, is it like three or four years you said to, that's like how long, you know, on average the process is to, you know, from the time you're saying, I wanna go to Antarctica to the time you actually travel there and set foot on the ice? You know, as I've talked to more of our teams, it's, it's usually a three year process yeah. by the time you Figure out what the team is, what you're going to do, study the maps, figure out the travel plan, put the application in. It's going to take six to nine months to review. You get funding back, and then you have to make sure you have all your gear on a boat leaving some harbor probably six to eight months before you're going to need it. Yeah. It has to handle, traverse all the way down to Antarctica, get offloaded, and be handled and ha headed to where you're going at the right time. And do, do, we, do we usually take like a straight boat right there or do we stop at like a port like in South America or something and then re refuel and re get supplies and then go down or is it just a straight drive down I mean um I mean like I guess uh, my really question is how on, hard would yeah, the trip yeah. how long would the trip be like on by boat let's say well it varies because we have we have three big bases so most stuff comes in, into McMurdo or Palmer Station and Palmer Station is serviced largely by boat McMurdo can be serviced by boat or by plane but for McMurdo if it's big equipment, it's going to come in on the ship because it's more economical mm -hmm. to do it that way. If your personnel or maybe higher value items or food restock, it's going to come in on a plane. And so it depends on what it is, but you have to plan out enough. It's also something where maybe people aren't accustomed to living in Ohio in the suburbs or yeah. city that you just don't click Amazon or go to Walmart or <laughs> if you're missing something. So if you have a critical in ingredient and it breaks, you better be able to service service it in the field yeah and you have to make sure all those contingencies are planned for because if you're at that deep field site and it breaks you've now wasted a lot of money and you have no way to service your equipment yeah and that's not what a lot a lot of people don't think about those kind of logistics when talking about like exploration in general like how much equipment you have to bring especially nowadays with all the technology that we're using down there i can imagine like you know lugging that stuff around and that's i guess what plays into like the difficulty with you know exploring the entire continent is just you know being able to move all of that equipment and 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 people and, and resources yeah i can imagine so you uh, how many people are living down there currently like you depends know depends on the field season so the seasons are reversed yeah. so the the field season is in our winter so okay. november december january february march um south pole has a contingent of people that overwinter there that's a pretty small crew and then there's a lot more that come in for research in the summer. McMurdo has permanent staff that's there, and some of the other bases around the world. Different countries have different bases that permanent we staff. Permanent staff. But it's you know some of them are seasonal, some of them okay. aren't. And I would say in the off season you probably have a few hundred on the entire continent. So this is wow. a continent the size of one and a half, mm -hmm. you know, continental United States is. And you think about only a few hundred people being there. And then the the, the prime of the year probably a few thousand. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so you said in the winter is usually, so how many uh, expeditions are going out this year, that if would, any? Well, that's... Because <laughs> well, I know with the pandemic, yeah. they're, they're probably putting a lot of blocks on that. Yeah, like, so COVID's disrupted stuff. So that'd be something you'd have to check with SCAR on because yeah. there's this international coordination. A lot of the U.S. expeditions have been disrupted, so they've been trying to, since it's the second year of a disruption, deal with critical systems, so stuff that's atmospheric sciences and meteorology or astronomy, but there's a lot of other equipment in that that has not been serviced or had the data taken out of it and we're going into our just our second year of disruptions um so covid's not been good especially for a lot of researchers that are new to the field um i'm i have an article that i uh that i found from 2016 and talking about antarctica i'm just gonna briefly uh mention it but 
uh, just kind of what do you guys know about the uh, about the Wilkes Land uh, uh, meteor? Uh, I'm sorry, gravity, the gravity anomaly in Wilkes in Wilkes Land. Like, it, have you heard about that? Where they had like you know basically these satellites up in up in up in space, and they were you know measuring the Earth's gravity pulls because throughout you know. Uh, the planet basically because you know gravity varies depending on your elevation and whatnot so you know they basically found this uh you know giant mass of about like 300 miles of you know this strong gravitational pull in the south pole and, and i was wondering like since then what kind of research we've done on that because i know it was uh, one of the guys one of the scientists uh that was a part of that was from ohio state uh what's his name uh had it written? It's in this article. I'm trying to find it, but yeah, Ralph von Fries is name. Yeah. So what, what? What? How come we haven't really heard much about that since yeah, 2006? So I, well, I, I think people may not be aware. Uh, gravimetric studies have been used for a long time to try to figure out what's beneath the Earth's surface. Right. So if you think about, we have a planet. We all in middle school learned a little about the structure of it. And you might say, well, nobody's been there. How do you really know what it looks like? So earthquakes and the waves given off by them are one way we can do it, but also these gravimetric studies to figure out what is the depth of the continent and yeah. what's it look like beneath the and surface. Especially if that's important with Antarctica. Yeah. So a lot of it is giving us a sense of what's, what is happening beneath the surface. We also use it, we have satellites now that are not just you walking on the surface and taking these measurements, but flying over the Earth's surface. And we use it even to figure out where is water distributed. Mm -hmm. So there's the GRACE satellites, which are two satellites, and the distance between them as they fly over a location helps us figure out how much water is beneath the surface in places like California. So it's just a technique that's used to allow us to peer beneath and see where's the water distributed, how deep is the continent, or what rock is the continent made of. Yeah. And and so like with that, like how, how, has any research on that in particular that you guys know of, like has that expanded at all or is it just like did it end up just being nothing at all or I don't know? Well, I think it's ongoing and, and part of the important the reason it's relevant right now right. is we really want to know what's what's it look like beneath the earth mm -hmm. beneath the surface of the ice so how deep is the continent if that ice is removed is the continent going to be above sea level or below right. sea level and then what does that mean for sea level rise and how it's going to affect the coast around the rest of the world mm -hmm. so you know techniques like this and using radar to penetrate through the ice and, and see what that looks like gives us a better sense of how much is the ocean going to rise as we lose a lot of this ice in antarctica okay uh, so yeah not much on the uh, on the gravity side, but more it's, it's just it's it was just more weird. yeah. It's like it's one of those things where you use different methods to get a clear idea of what it looks like, and this yeah. is one of the methods that's used. But it goes back a long time. I think if you all the way go back to Humboldt, who's exploring South America in the 1700s, yeah. he was using similar techniques, barometric pressure and gravimetric. So this is not a new method, but it's a method we get better at using using with time, right? And and more accurate, but it it helps us see part of the puzzle um yeah here we go i got here's a question i had uh what are the most commonly used methods for drilling into polar ice and glaciers yeah so the bird center probably is a bit more known for ice cores that are drilled in mountains uh, but ice cores are also drilled in antarctica and greenland are, are two ice caps right. that are left um old school way and the way you can go out and do it if you're sampling to plan for an expedition is you can use a hand auger which i've watched people do and is very time consuming and draining where you actually use a big bore and you spin it and yeah. corkscrew your way into the ice and then pull this ice up usually a meter at a time so you take a meter out you drop that drill back in drill down another meter pull One that out meter at a time meter a yard at a time wow now some of our teams have claimed they've been able to get i think 36 feet doing that <laughs> um i can tell you it looks a lot more grueling as you get deeper oh, yeah, and deeper I can imagine so the the campaigns that go out to get a few thousand years worth of ice, what they're doing is, is they bring out mechanized equipment. So you bring out a generator, you bring out a, a drilling assembly, and you actually drill up with machinery. And and with that, have we found, like, you know, while drilling and doing these kind of expeditions, have we found anything, like, frozen in the ice, like maybe vegetation or, you know, maybe even animals? I don't know. <laughs> like, anything that's been, like, frozen in time that would lead you to believe that there maybe was life on Antarctica at some point in our Earth's history? Yeah, there's um, you can find a lot of things. So I mean, there's microscopic stuff. There's pollen. There's viruses. Uh, we have a big mm -hmm. project going yeah, on right now looking at viruses. Yeah, I saw something yeah. about that. Yeah, um, you can find larger things sometimes. Not in Antarctica so much, but some of our teams have found leaves that get blown up in storms in the Amazon. That get deposited in the Andes, and those will get preserved in the ice. 
um, insects sometimes that get preserved. And those are great because they let you carbon date stuff. Right. So they give you dating techniques. There's maybe the biggest example is the Utsi Man, which was discovered in Europe in the mid-90s, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who had... They were run over by the glacier, so they died. Their body was there, probably desiccated. And then as snows fell, the snows, either they got run over by the glacier or the snows grew over top of them, and this body was preserved, and then it melted out thousands of years later. Yeah, it was kind of like, uh, I know I don't even know if this was true, but I remember hearing like in the news that there was like this, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, mammoth, I guess, that they had found. I don't even know if they found that in, in Antarctica, but I know that they found that somewhere, and they were trying to clone it or thaw it out or whatever. I don't know. I don't even know if that's still happening or not. I don't know if it was glacier ice, but you do. F the permafrost is changing dramatically in the Arctic, mm -hmm. and a lot of things that got buried in permafrost froze in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so, as the as that permafrost melts back, we are finding stuff like mammoths. Um, and then, in fact, there was an example in the poster of the dispatch today about a, about a, a mammoth tusk that they're using, and they can plot the place that this mammoth went in its life in in the Arctic using that because it wasn't wasn't lithified it didn't become rock it just dried out and it's still the right. tusk itself oh so yeah it's fully preserved yeah so we are getting the chance unfortunately because of all the permafrost that's melting to study a lot of stuff in the arctic we wouldn't have otherwise right and i mean i think with that it kind of opens up it's kind of opening up opportunity too like because like you know it's it's almost making the mystery start to go away like naturally but like yeah i mean there's definitely negative effects but uh with that i mean uh, my I guess my question is: is wh when was Antarctica like? F when did what like when was it fully frozen like this? Was it because of the ice age or was it before that? Um, I mean, I guess. Yeah. So a few things to think about. One is it used to be closer to the equator, so it was closer to India, and plate tectonics it moved into its current arrangement over the last hmm. few million years, tens of millions of years, and so that's meant that the the climate it experiences is different. We also have the CO2 levels in the atmosphere that have changed. Yeah, they fluctuate like crazy. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, you had a time period that both due to that, but also due to its arrangement on the on the globe, it went into much colder conditions. And, and in fact, this kind of puzzled some of the early British explorers, although it made sense, they just chalked it up to the climate changes. They would find these, these remnants of tree ferns, these lithified rock uh, stumps that were the remnants of old trees that had been there. And they just would look around and go, well, there's really not any <laughs> plant life here now. There's yeah. mosses and lichens, but there's these big tree stumps that are preserved that we found elsewhere in the world. That must have meant the climate was different. Now, this yeah. is long before plate tectonics. Right. So they couldn't fill in the rest of the picture, but they knew the climate couldn't have always been the same. And you also find things like um, these ammonites that are, are marine species that are extinct, mm -hmm. and you don't find those except for warm tropical waters. So they knew that this place wasn't always the cold environment that it was when they were exploring. Yeah, and I, I bet beneath the ice, like, we'll find, you know, through time, more and more evidence of that, you know, being the case. Because, like, I know they found, like, the frozen, like, you know, tree uh, branches as well and all sorts of dinosaurs, stuff. Dinosaurs, you know, Crylophorus, yeah, Cryl right, Dinosaurus eliotii, which was discovered by David Elliott from the Bird Center. Right. Wow. So wait, when was that discovered? So that would have been oh geez, seventies or eighties. Okay, well, you know, can't the remember funny, the exact yeah. date. Yeah, and yeah. we'd interviewed him not that long ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and how? What other dinosaurs do you guys know that have been discovered down there? That's the most famous. I mean, there's whole yeah. genera that have been discovered since then. And he he'll tell you the story of his was he accidentally stopped for a break and tripped over this rock that looked unusual. And it was that observation and somebody who was in a valley, two valleys over that came over a few days later and made that discovery. Otherwise, if you ignore interesting observations, you miss stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I have a I got another question here. Uh, what here's a here's a here's an opinion question for both you guys. <laughs> what are uh, what do you think? What first of all, what is what do you think is Admiral Byrd's biggest ach achievement in his life? And then I'll ask the same for Wilkins, but for both you guys, I guess. <clears throat> so Jason mentioned the heroic age of exploration, and then the mechanical age. I would say Byrd's contributions go toward the mechanical age. That he was kind of the beginning of. Machines, planes, all of that stuff. We're going to try these different things in Antarctica. He still took sled dogs mm -hmm. because, you know, don't know how those machines are going to do. So right. you want to be prepared. You're yeah. going to be gone for three years. Mm -hmm. You got to use that as a hedge. Yeah. yeah. So, but he developed uh, radio. 
he sent, you know, the first radio messages from Antarctica. So I feel like it, he is, um, should be, well, and I think is remembered for that. He was kind of the beginning of the mechanical age and how you could use that's, you know, those uh, machines, so to speak, uh, successfully in a very cold place. Right, because he started, you know, exploring kind of towards the, uh, you know, end, I guess, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So, like, all of that new technology mm -hmm. was just kind of being thrusted into his hands. And yeah, he was really excited about planes. I mean, he mm -hmm. was really excited about planes. Yeah, and he flew across Antarctica, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, how, so he... How, yeah, how far did he fly, I guess? Oh, gosh. I like never, from, from I never know these the facts yeah. like that. I never know that stuff yeah. off the top of my head. What I can tell you that I find fascinating is there's some footage in that film that Jason was referencing where they um, have to <laughs> blow the snow off the plane's engine. <laughs> like they open it up and it's like, oh, my Lord, I would never board that plane <laughs> in a million years, you know. So the risk that they took you know, the oils would freeze and they had to try to accommodate all of these things that with machines that weren't meant to work in such a cold place. Yeah. So pretty brave. Yeah. And I imagine there's so many, there's so much like troubleshooting too. Mm -hmm. Like you can imagine, especially when you mentioned how they flew planes and landed them on the ice. Like I can imagine there'd be times when they'd be landing the planes and they get stuck in the ice or when they're trying to take off and the, you know, those, I guess the plane would have like skis or something like that to kind of mm -hmm. keep it on the ground but I can imagine like just stuff like that you don't even think about like when you just look at this at face value but like how many like problems they had to stumble across just by trying to get to these places when well, you think about how difficult it is so the so bird flies over the South Pole and there's all these maps of where they traverse mm -hmm. but it's interesting then and that's in the 30s mm -hmm. early 30s but then the first and this is only because a, a bird member Henry Brecker was on the first U.S. expedition to go to South Pole via the land, and it's in the late 50s. So from the 30s to the 50s, the U.S. never sent an expedition via land there, even yeah. though they had Crazy. flown over it. And you realize that gives you a sense of how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. Nobody even attempted right. on the U.S. side to do it. Crazy. And, and what would you guys say is Wilkins' biggest... Uh, achievement well, well, so just for Wilkins, the people out there that don't know who yeah. they are. Well, Wilkins has a great big life. So if you don't know anything about Wilkins... You know, do some we, research. He's a fascinating he is. figure. He had a huge life. He is actually the first to fly a plane in Antarctica. Yes. So, so there's that. But honestly, his biggest contribution might be, might be, uh, he was the first to take a submarine under the ice. Yeah, the Nautilus, it, right? That was in the mm -hmm. that was in the Arctic Circle, right? Right. And so that may have been considered a, an epic fail because yeah. he wasn't as successful as he wanted to be, but he did prove that it could be done. So I don't know. I would say, again, he had a huge life. He was a World War One photographer. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he did all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I saw some of the images out there. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. So, you know, it's tough to, It's tough to pick one <laughs> one thing. Yeah, I guess him. with like, with like, I guess it would be probably just flying, being able to fly over the. Uh, it's pretty big, land. pretty big deal. Yeah. I don't know. I would say, and it was, I really never thought as much about his World War II photography until mm -hmm. that movie that's being produced now by, I, I don't know the name, the Australian filmmaker. Oh. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole section on the World War I photography, and I was deeply moved by. Yeah. It's unbelievable. The, yeah, some of the shots of the trenches. It's disturbing, and... yeah. But I think for a lot of people, we don't, World War I gets glazed over. We don't really oh, think yeah. of how brutal it was. And I, the pic pictures are disturbing. Well, and what's really interesting about that is he was a photographer in World War One with another well-known polar guy, Frank Hurley. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting to me that the two of them were together as photographers in World War One, And Hurley was supposed to be documenting the war, the feel, the, you know, telling the story of the war. So Hurley was like the first, you know, Photoshop artist, really. He would he would tweak the photos. Oh, really? He would uh -huh. edit them. Yeah. So like, what would he so he could lay in a dark sky over uh, a field or whatever. Wilkins' job was to document it factually. Yeah. So it, we sometimes don't know who took what picture. We're we're sometimes unclear about right. that. But I, for me, that is a really interesting point that the the World War One stuff and the fact that the two of them also did polar exploration is just kind of a crazy. Yeah, do you, yeah, maybe it stemmed from there. Happenstance. Or, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, an, it's just interesting. Yeah. 
It is. It's like it's an interesting kind of coincidence mm-hmm. how they maybe you know maybe it was over discussion or something. They mm-hmm. both but did they research together or did they go on their own ways? I'm trying to remember. I can't remember if they were. I believe they may have been together at some point. Yeah. Because Hurley was British too, so British, Australian, all that's yeah, inter- they're all yeah, the Commonwealth of Britain mm-hmm. or whatever you sent them on these various expeditions, but I can't remember exactly. I just think it's interesting that they wound up together in this way, and that photography is crazy. And they, in fact, they were called crazy, like oh, the. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, the servicemen were like, those photographers are nuts. Yeah, I mean, well, Rich wasn't, I don't know, if this might be a rumor, this might be, you know, this is something I read on the internet, but wasn't Bird in, admitted to like a, a facility, like a, you know, mental institution or something? I, that might be fake. I don't know. But I was reading some stuff. Well, any, okay. <laughs> like once I said, again, yeah. read something on the internet, don't believe it. That's why I wanted to come to you guys more. Well, once again, anything's possible. Right. But I am unaware of that okay. particular fact. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, it's been interesting over the last year, though, with COVID, it's we a number of us picked up Alone, which is the book mm-hmm. about his wintering over in Antarctica, 120 miles away from his base. Mm-hmm. And just how timely that book was to read it this year, where he chose mm-hmm. to spend five and a half months by himself, four and a half months. Mm-hmm. And how that was so, it meant a little bit more this year as mm-hmm. we were all spending time yeah, away from people. Right, right. Excellent book, too. You should read it. What is it called? It's called Alone. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was more honest than I... It's pretty honest. I mean, Mm -hmm. there was a ghostwriter on it, but I Mm -hmm. felt it was more transparent than I expected it to be, especially in that time period where you really had to self-promote your success in order to fund your next expedition. I found it to be more honest than I thought Well, and they pushed him to write that. So he he didn't write it right away. And so, yeah, he did have a ghostwriter, but there is a lot of documentation in the collection of their correspondence back and forth and and arguing about, look, I told you I don't want that included, or Mm -hmm. yes, that's really important, and you need to make sure that you include X, Y, Z. So he had a lot to do with that. Yeah, and and you kind of get lost a little bit in the PR side of it, because, yeah, you do need to kind of promote these. Mm -hmm. You need to promote your next expedition. You need to show your work in a way that's presentable Mm -hmm. and, and that people can be like, okay, that makes sense. And, like, it's a lot harder than you think, especially when you're not really versed in, like, communications or PR or anything like you're especially for bird he was a scientist like and a, you know an explorer like he wouldn't know that much about PR so it's interesting that you know these people would hire you know ghostwriters and you know p- almost like PR people to kind of help them you know fund their next exposition and their next uh, thing that's that's an interesting thing well bird was about. actually an excellent marketer yes of he was I've seen some interviews so he actually knew what he was doing there he, yeah. he said he disliked it, but he was awfully good at it. Yeah. Well, that's what I think one of his claims to fame is. Some uh-huh. of the stuff he pulled off, and he, he never really lost a life. Right? No, he, lost he did a, not. Yeah. He lost one of his pilots mm-hmm. in a test but flight. He, right. But, but he, he was able to pull this off and garner enough support in the time period, but he had very few fatalities, which we said is probably the reason why he never had a movie made about him. Yeah. It's, there's no drama. <laughs> yeah, right. that's true. Right? Stay, faith, stay yeah. faithful to his wife. You know, there was, there was not the drama that can be associated with people that are gone for lots of years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I can't imagine there's much temptation down there in the, in the freezing cold, but yeah, that's, it, that is interesting though. Like, you know, in like, you would think like Hollywood, yeah, they would be all over some, a character like Bird or, or Will, maybe Wilkins more, but like, let's we'll say for Bird, but like you said, like, you know, he wasn't that, you know. Some year we figured yeah. it'll happen sometime. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it'll happen. Yeah. But yeah. And I feel like they'll take liberties with it though, as Hollywood does, but. Well, we're a little complacent with how easy it is to get, again, non-COVID times, a little complacent with how easy it is to get anywhere that we want to go. Uh-huh. So, you know, just the logistics of getting there was a big deal. Mm-hmm. We're like, well, you know, it's easy to get anywhere. It might take a long time, but it's, I don't need to worry mm-hmm. about that. I can get anywhere that I want to go. And so it's hard to, to probably hard to remember a time in which you can't just get anywhere that you want to go without a major, you know, I got to line up two ships. I got to plan for three years. How many, you know, how many men am I going to need? You know, there's just so much to it. Yeah. So, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh yeah. Uh, oh, Antarctic volcanoes. I want to talk about this a little hmm. bit. Uh, what, I mean, how many vol- active volcanoes are, 
or maybe not, maybe mm-hmm. not how many, but like what are like the most what's the most active volcano in uh, in Antarctica? Because I know there are some, and that kind of leads credence to like maybe the ice melting. I don't know if that has anything to do I with think it. But Erebus still is Erebus. the southern yeah, southernmost active volcano. Um, I mean, the volcanoes are different, so not all of them spew magma. Right, they release gases, and some of them, mm-hmm. um, but. Because of this silicone era of remote sensing and satellites, we're able to look at a lot of surfaces that are changing and actually think there could be more activity beneath the surface that we'll be able to discover soon. Mm -hmm. But so much of this is covered by ice. Right. And so there's probably more than we know of. And hopefully in the next few years, figure out more about that. David Elliott, that's actually kind of one of his areas of expertise, I believe. Uh, Yeah. Do we, so like, are there any like accesses or passages to get like beneath the ice easier or is it just like you know you got to drill <laughs> no, <laughs> like, is I mean, there, like places like little caverns yeah. that people can find to fit through or is it like straight up just drill and that's the only way you can get beneath the ice yeah so i mean most of the continent except for the periphery and these nunatucks that extend through the ice sheet you're dealing with about a mile of ice thick yeah so you're gonna have to drill through it and then if you can sample beneath the surface you have, to have the right equipment to do that if there are any kind of tunnels or passages where the ice flows over a surface, mm-hmm. it's in motion all the time. Right. So See, just because it's there today doesn't mean it's going to look the same three or four days from now. Yeah, and you could get trapped under there, too. Yeah. So even, I mean, teams that have done, there was an account I'd read recently of a researcher that was doing sampling at the edge of one of them and doing something which I consider quite dangerous, which is diving in an ice, an area with ice that's actively moving. And those can spin and twist and the canals the openings can change and you can get crushed um it's a dynamic system it's mm-hmm. not the same day to day right and, and you would think because it's so massive that like it moves at such a slow pace but like when you just look at like small you know chunks of it like it moves a lot faster than you know i you would think i guess yeah like you like you said three or four days the, the landscape can be completely different and like yeah, that's not really something people think about with uh, like with Antarctica is like how fluid it really is. Because I mean, it really is just made of water. Like you know, so frozen. you'll see yeah, you'll see pictures of like people will go to Iceland and take pictures of ice caves mm-hmm. beneath surfaces where there's maybe a hot spring beneath it or mm-hmm. something, and it's beautiful and it's probably a short uh, time to get there. Are people that explore those, but it's more for the photography and exploration, and they might be doing some work with the microbes beneath it. But I would say that's more in those systems than it is beneath an ice sheet yeah. where it's a mile deep. That's not gonna yeah, I was, and I guess you're gonna like, set equipment down. That kind of leads into my question: like, are, are there like any evidence of like hot springs or anything like that in like in Antarctica, like where you know there's little havens of of heat, I guess, or is it just like yeah? I'm sure there are. I, I don't. Yeah, you don't know about yeah. them in detail. I mean, part of the reason of drilling a mile beneath is to look at the ecosystem down there right. because with a with an ice surface that's this expansive, we know that it's serving as an insulating blanket, and so there's a lot mm-hmm. of there's. Conditions beneath the surface that we know now are very favorable to life, but life right. that's very different than what exists now on the surface. And maybe is a throwback to what was there in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of equipment's used to study that more than sending a person there. Yeah. And we're only starting to scratch the surface on that research. Because I think the other concern is if you go to study it, you don't want to destroy it. Right. And we introduced equipment if it's not sterilized. And you, the videos you saw probably had a chemical treatment and even a UV treatment because the concern was we don't want to contaminate this fragile surface when we go to investigate it. Yeah, especially when you're looking at life forms that are completely foreign to humanity. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Like, so like how many new species have we discovered down there? I mean, obviously, yeah, you know, ballpark, you know, and obviously you don't have a real statistic maybe, but from that, ex- might, but. that expedition alone, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of stuff they did. They saw immediately saw that they weren't familiar with Mm -hmm. um but the papers that's three years ago Mm -hmm. and they've only started to publish all the work from that wow i hear there's a movie coming out so uh, we are actually doing a vr tour for that project we have the footage that we're building that so maybe later on this fall there'll be both the vr tour and also this film coming out and how how does the vr tours work because i know you're uh responsible for a lot of that so we have uh we were lucky before covid we had some of the gopro cameras we started sending out in the field they were we got a grant they were low cost they're really durable most of our teams don't have time to set up like a gigapan photo but these cameras they could put up they were reliable and we collected footage and we knew we wanted to do something with it and it wasn't until we were able to hack together some solutions with some real estate software we were able to build the tours and then when COVID hit, we were sitting on ex- many expeditions of video that it gave us the time to go ahead and build right. out. And now people was, now are looking for opportunities to 
virtually get out of their house if they can't physically get yeah, out of their house. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of a it kind of almost fell in your lap in a way where the pandemic, yeah. like where you're just like, well, we got all the footage now. Now we can just sit down and take the time to ourselves to kind of compile it all together and make it right. So yeah, I guess that could have been a happy accident there, but um, a little bit uh, more here. Uh, how how accurate uh, do you th- are Google Maps? and Google Earth's representation of Antarctica compared to like the most accurate maps that you've seen, I guess. I guess uh, Google, you may be surprised, is different by the country you're in because Google has to buy their imagery from something and countries like the US pay a lot of money to have flyovers. And so even if you look at this, you can get a better sense if you look at the historical photos where you can go back in time and look at Las Vegas and Mm -hmm. you'll be like, well, in the past, the pictures aren't as clear. Well, it wasn't the same resolution. Mm-hmm. That's true anywhere in the world. And I, I experienced this when I went to India the first time and when I was in South America because the quality of imagery was less and especially in the mountains because the country doesn't pay for it and Google maybe has nothing they can buy. They do have contracts with some satellite companies now, mm-hmm. which lets them fill in the gaps. Yeah. But it's going to be a much grainier photo than the art if you look at Columbus, Ohio or anywhere right. in the U.S. Yeah, and I think yeah, a lot of it is there's no there's no civilization, so like they just feel well, you know, we don't need it for the road for the roads or the maps or anything like that. So like yeah, they probably just don't fuss with it, and that's probably the case. But like it's opened a lot of discussion because people go on, you know, they try to do their own exploring on Google Earth, and they find these blotches, and they're like, okay, why is this blurred out, kind of thing. Like, so I was just kind of asking like if you had more of a idea of how the process works, because like maybe it could just be simple that they just didn't buy that specific part of Antarctica, and that's why it's blurred out, but. You know, people obviously have ideas that, oh, they're hiding something, you know, and, and maybe they are. But, like, you know, I was just going to kind of ask what the process is for Google Earth and, like, how yeah. they... Well, Google's like any other company. They have to make money. Right, And yeah. so if you're not making a lot, selling a lot of ad revenue or click revenue by images of Antarctica, so they have the basic level stuff you can use. Um, there are higher-end products you can pay for, and you can buy higher-quality images. You also get artifacts. You know, there's cloud covers sometimes the year. This is a surface which is very different than the rest of the planet because it's reflective. Right. And so a lot of times that creates artifacts that maybe look like something it's not. I know we had a question about an iceberg that looked like a ship in disguise. <laughs> you know, there's so many icebergs out there, it's like clouds, right? Mm-hmm. My, my daughter looked up the other night and saw a cloud look like an elephant. That doesn't mean it was an elephant. Right. <laughs> but your, your odds of getting animals that right. look, the clouds that look like creatures, it's possible to see that if you look at enough of them. Right. <laughs> so what can, what can we learn from Antarctica in 2021 mm-hmm. and moving forward? And this is a question for both you guys. Well... So I'm not the science person. The science guy will answer that better than I will. But Well, then I'll frame it this way for you. Like, What, what can we learn about the polar <laughs> expeditions of the past moving right. forward? Right. So I go back to that whole climate science thing, honestly. I do believe, I really do believe that climate and the, fa- and the fact that it's changing is bringing some of this to the surface for people that may not have really cared or noticed before. Yeah, pun intended. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I, actually, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. But again, the fam- I already spoke about this, but again, the families and the connections to family and history of family, I also think is a huge driver. So it just happens that family went to Antarctica. You know, that's it's still magical. Most of us are never going to get there. No. So it's still, even though it's easier to get there now, it's still a magical place for most of us that most of us are not going to be able right. to go. And you have to have a purpose and high yeah. level vetting. And, yeah. yeah, so I still think it's a place that seems mysterious a little bit, uh-huh. even though we know more and still, again, magical. I'm still, you know, I'm, I don't travel enough to where I'm jaded by it. So I'm still, I still think it's a miracle to get up in Columbus and go to bed in Australia. Yeah. So, you know. For, for most of us, that kind of travel feels very exotic. So I think that's partly why it, you know, it still it remains to be one of the places that most of us are never going to get to see. But with climate change and, and melting, if you're not paying attention right now to what's going on and the effect that the, that melt will have on the rest of us, you know, yeah, <laughs> just think. It's got no, far-reaching, far-reaching impacts. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would say that it has a lot to teach us about the past as we try to figure out what is the story yeah. of Earth's past. There's a lot of stuff that's preserved there that mm-hmm. is still largely untapped and some really creative ways we're 
accessing that and, and discovering not just about Antarctica, but the rest of the world from right. Antarctica. Um, the second is, you know, we think of ourselves living in Ohio. We're not even halfway to the North Pole. You know, we're yeah. slightly closer to the equator. That's true. But polar regions affect our weather. Mm -hmm. They affect our ocean circulation. They affect our, affect our seas. They affect where other people move from in the world. And so it's interesting to think of Ohio as a place that people kind of laugh when they think, you have a polar center there? Mm -hmm. I mean, we were right. glaciated 10,000 years ago, but, and we realized maybe more than any other time in our past, these remote regions that Ohio State does research, that research is more important to us than it's ever been mm -hmm. because the changes happening there are having a direct effect on Ohio. Yeah. And you, and you don't really think about it because, like, they're so far away and nobody's been there. Well, mm -hmm. people have been there, but not a lot of people have been there. So it's like, yeah, it gets strat in this mystery. And I think the mystery of it is what just drawing people to it the most, I think, in my opinion. It's just like, and it definitely is what drew me into it, is like, this is just this massive mess on our planet. And literally, like you said, we know more about other planets and their their climates and their surface than, our, than our, the biggest continent on our planet. One of the biggest. I don't know if it's the actual biggest, but is it? I don't know. <laughs> it's to be the, well, the second smallest yeah. besides Australia. Oh, then I was wrong. Oh, yeah, because I'm thinking uh, North and South Still America. Still a big expanse. Well, yeah, very big. Yes. And, and again, the <laughs> fact that most of us are never going to see it yeah. in person. Right. So. Yeah, it leads to that mystery and, and, mm -hmm. and wanting to explore more of it. But thank you guys so much for this time, honestly. And, uh, and I know it's been busy, crazy time for all of us, but... Uh, thank you for giving giving some time to to talk about this with me and and kind of, you know, give me some more context onto you know some of the myths and and ideas that we see online and maybe there is truth to it maybe there's not and that's kind of the I guess the conclusion everybody comes to when they talk about this is like there just isn't enough out there to to prove that there is but that doesn't mean there isn't and that's kind of where you're like it's good that people question these kind of things you know but at the same time it's like you know, going to the source and, and trying to get as much of the information as you can to kind of form your own hypothesis, I think is important. And I guess that's kind of why I was here, because I had so many questions and I was like, hey, I live an hour and a half away. Why don't I just drive <laughs> up and talk to him about it? And like I said, thank you guys so much for, sure. for giving your time. But is there anything you want to share or plug or, or promote anything you guys are doing, talks, events? I mean, I know pandemic and whatnot, but, you know, besides that, uh, you know, is there anything you guys are doing? I guess the one thing I would, if, if I'm going to give a plug, is yeah. that we, the Polar Archives gives a research award every year. Uh, we did not give it last year, but we are going, going to pick up again this year with that. So that's, I would like people to know about that. We do, it, it can be hard if you're not located nearby to do work in an archives. We have, you know, limited hours yeah. to do research and all of that. So... Uh, we give this Polar Archives Research Award. It's $5,000. It's a chunk of money. And um, it can uh, allow a researcher to pay for whatever they need to pay for in order to come here. It can pay for travel, hotel, whatever they need. So I guess um, in terms of plugging something, i just like people to know about that. Sure. Our application process is very straightforward. It's on our website. And we'll probably be doing a call for proposals end of September ish i'm gonna say early early october so that's my plug and mine would be you know we have a really good group of undergraduates that have been creative and helping us design a lot of these innovative products like the vr and the the globe but that's allowed us to run a lot of virtual programs this mm -hmm. year and we have mm -hmm. would really run these programs for thousands of people in person and that's a very different audience than the right. audience tuning in some of them are local but a lot of them are from all over the world and all mm -hmm. over the country and so Laura and I have had some with movie screenings and panel discussions that are things we, we want to keep that we never would have done had COVID not happened. Right. right. That's right. We're pl actually planning another one. Mm. I don't know if you saw my note about Jeff Maynard. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to do a Wilkins one in January or February. Okay. So, awesome. and, and it's going to be another virtual event. And it, I don't know that we ever would have done it without COVID. But, but it makes great <laughs> sense because our main speaker is an, an Australian. Mm -hmm. okay. So... It's kind of a challenge for the time zones, but we'll figure it out. But I guess like that's kind of a good thing from from it the is. pandemic is the idea that like you know, and I'm not I don't like Zoom. I don't like doing Zoom interviews personally, but like for for what you guys are doing, presentations and sharing information, it is really uh, an advantageous platform to use. And like 
uh, you know, you like you said, you can reach so many people in like all the different countries that you you know would have had to bring them all into Columbus or wherever to meet up. Mm-hmm. Now you can kind of just show them the information remotely. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I guess that's kind of a silver lining. But you know, like I said, I like the the personal mm-hmm. conversation. I feel like they're just more for a conversation, you know. But for presentation, the Zoom is is the way to go. Well, yeah. We value yeah, that. That's just, we, value that yeah. we value that interpersonal more than ever. Oh yeah. But we do get to hear from some of the best speakers right. in the world now. So yeah. Best of yeah. both worlds, maybe when we yeah. come back. Yeah, exactly. Do a little bit of both. Yeah. yeah. But thank you guys so much for this thank time, you. honestly, and your guys' thank wisdom you. and knowledge. And uh, I'll be showing some of the uh, artifacts off. I, I have some B roll, so and I'll definitely do some explanations on that. But uh, I mean, I guess if you want to do a quick, like, little breakdown sure. of each of them. But I mean, you know, just sure. like a thirty-second thing. I mean, you don't have to go into too much detail, but. I got to look to see what I brought out. So um, the sun compass that sits there, that was used by Bird in 1926 on his North North Pole flight. So he had an actual North Pole compass and a South Pole compass. And I've been told that's the North Pole compass. Okay. I personally couldn't tell you the difference, but I'm sure there is one. Um, So that's important because... Bird claimed to be the first to fly over the North Pole, mm-hmm. and that's been a hotly disputed yeah. claim. But in any case, we have that beautiful compass. Wow. Um, going that way, uh, Admiral Bird's game, so Admiral Bird's South Pole game, <laughs> that is actually one of the few items that I've actually purchased for the collection. Oh, wow. Um, but it's so cool and so amazing. Yeah, and that... it, go- it kind of goes toward the whole popular culture. Yeah, I want that. The, I want like a poster of that, that the front of that game. We all do. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that is an awesome graphic. But... I know, it really is. And uh, apparently it was very successful, like for about two, three years after they started producing them. And then it fell off completely and they yeah. quit making them. Uh, so I feel glad that we were able to get that. Also related to the popular culture thing, the map that is there is we call it the grape nuts map general foods was a big sponsor of birds expeditions and you could like uh save your box tops or something send it in and they would send you this map okay and what i love about the map is how much of it says unexplored yeah unexplored, unexplored there's so much of it yeah, i was looking at it earlier yeah um so that's that's a pretty cool item and we actually have i think two or three of those maps people love i mean people were really all about this oh that, yeah that's neat i would hang that on my wall i know it's beautiful uh the bottle was a couple different stories about these bottles. They were made by Owens Corning um, in Toledo. And the story, the official story, is that they were used to um, measure ocean currents. Okay. So they would put stuff in these bottles, throw them overboard, watch where they came in. Very good. Right? Yeah. I don't know if I'd buy that. It yeah. feels a little bit like yeah. publicity to me. Right. It probably was sold so or something. So I'm not really sure about it, but it is a pretty cool bottle. Yeah, and it, it, it did come ashore in New Zealand, I want to say, whoa. that particular one. So that's that's what that is. Can I just stumble upon that on the shore? I yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they're, they made like 500 of them or something. I have a news article about it. Yeah. It just feels like a publicity stunt to me. <laughs> um, but I don't know that for sure. The diary is Bird's um, North Pole diary. So that diary actually covers 1925 to 1927. So it includes the North Pole flight. That diary uh, has been studied and studied and Mm -hmm. studied some more. There are some erasures in there, which make people suspicious. Um, But it is the diary that he used when he documents reaching the North Pole. So it's pretty cool. It's open to a page that says we should be at the pole now. Mm -hmm. Make a circle and I will take a picture um, and then I want the sun, which references the sun compass and how he would navigate during that time period. And last but most certainly not least is a letter from Amelia Earhart to Bird offering the proceeds of a cigarette ad that she was doing. Wow. So that's just cool. That, yeah, that is yeah. about as old school as you can get right there. It's cigarette just very ads, cool. Amelia Earhart, Richard Bird. Yeah. Right. So very cool. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much again, both you guys, for showing me this awesome, uh, these awesome artifacts and and giving your wisdom and experience. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, guys, for listening. And uh, follow me on all the social media. You know the deal Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Yeah. Just follow me, audio podcasts on everything. And uh, thanks for listening. And let the beat drop.